Hello everybody. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to season two of Let's Talk Art, Culture, Travel, and More Club. Uh, I'm trying to do an open session. Hopefully, others will join too at some point. Uh, the topic is the Silk Road, then and now. Uh, I had uh, I learned a lot. I can say trying to put this together. So the sweep is rather broad, and. Uh, there is lot of geography, there is lot of uh, history, and there are different kinds of dynamics that are in play when you look at the Silk Road, especially now. So let's get going. Silk Road, then and now. So I'll be talking both about the ancient Silk Road and the new Silk Road, which is nothing but the um, Belt and Road Initiative from China. So this is how I have split my um, then and now slides or presentation or talk. So we will look at the genesis of the ancient Silk Road. Where was it? What were the countries involved? What was traded on it? What else was traded? There were a lot many things that were traded apart from uh, silk, uh, as the word Silk Road says. Religion, disease, architecture are three items that I have picked in this uh, category again lot of people travel lot of famous travelers but i picked these three for three different reasons we have heard of marco polo we have heard of ibn batuta we have, we have not actually heard of zheng he but he is uh, one great traveler let's look at the infrastructure that was available in to travel that uh, long uh, six thousand odd kilometers silk road and all good things come to an end it did end at some point why and what after that what do we look at when we go into the silk road now this is nothing but the belt and road initiative what are the international goals that china is trying to project what are actually the domestic goals that it is trying to achieve what are the land and sea corridors that it plans to build or revive as part of the belt and road initiative again how many countries what are the countries what else is China looking at when it talks of beyond road, rail, and ports, which is the linchpin of the Silk Road? When you look at the BR, uh, Belt and Road Initiative priorities, you will actually see where exactly we are, we are focusing. What are the benefits? What are the byproducts of the BRI? There have been cases of death, backlash, and a no, and then we will look at the string of pearls theory. So here we go. Before I talk about uh, the Chinese wanted horses. Let's take a look at the geography that uh, was prevalent when the Silk Road came into existence. This is India, to our east, the Himalayas, northeast, above it, the Tibetan Plateau, on top of it, China. And uh, take a look at this part, Xi'an, which is the actual place where the Silk Road commences. It is closer to Beijing on the east. And as you go up, you have Mongo Mongolia to the north. And uh, to the west of India, obviously, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and then the four, five stans, as they are called. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. This gray color back highlighted item is nothing but the Tian Shan Mountains which separates China from their beloved horses which were available in Uzbekistan. The story actually is because of this Tian Shan mountain. Um, to the south of Tian Shan mountain is the Saklamakan desert. Uh, this was fondly called, you go to this place and you will never return. This is what it was called back in BC 138 when the story of Genesis of the Silk Road begins. So this is the geography that we are looking at. And uh, keep in mind that Samarkand, the place from where the Mughals or the Babur came to India is in Samarkand. And to the south of uh, Tian Shan Mountains is nothing but the Pamir Mountains. That's also an important element here. And uh, there is something called the Tarim Basin on the border of Kyrgyzstan, uh, Kazakhstan and China. So that basin comes from the border line of this, somewhere here, Kazakhstan. Kyrgyzstan and all these places. So this is the geography that we'll be looking at as we discuss 
how and why the silk road started the ancient silk road so it is actually bc 138 there are two great powers which are emerging rome to the west and china to the east yes it is a superpower china has gained a lot of strength but it is being attacked by the mongols the turks and the ancestors of the huns who are called xiangnu this is how you spell it they are being rampant uh, bombarded from all sides by these three tribal uh, uh, tribes or tribal armies and uh, to fight them they have their puny small horses china didn't have the beautiful or the heavenly horses that were available in the uh, on the other side of the tian shan mountain so what did the chinese crave they they had seen or heard of those horses and they wanted them but they were afraid of crossing the tian shan mountain they were afraid of crossing the taklamakan uh, uh, desert so one brave emperor the han emperor decided that he wanted to cross and get those heavenly horses again if you look at the picture on the left you will see xian which is nothing but changan its traditional name is xian in 138 bc the han emperor was wudi so he said i need those horses so he chose a person called zhang xian and he sent him with 100 people and told them go across the taklamakan desert cross the tian shan mountains go to those five stans and get me those heavenly horses and this person zhang xian actually travels he crosses through the mountains he's gone for 13 years is captured twice one of the jail terms was almost 10 years and by then wudi the emperor has given up hope thinking that zhang xian is not coming back but 13 years later he comes back just with one companion he had gone with 100 people he comes back with one person and he had such fabulous tales to tell he had heard of a fabulous country called persia he had heard of india and these two countries were already tra- trading with the western world he had heard of them he had not seen them woody is now all energized he but remember he is gone but he has not come back with those horses so he sent another mission to fergana valley which is nothing but samarkand current samarkand to buy those horses those people refused to sell they could treat them as or think of them as sacred horses and they refused to sell them they come back the mission is not successful woody again now is desperate he sent 6000 people 60000 people across 2400 kilometers over the tian shan mountains and they go and they actually come back with a breeding herd of those large horses and brought them back to china then on it's the all the way to the rise of china so the chinese power china goes and defeats those huns they were driven away from the entire tarim basin china's power extended all the way up, across the ancient mountain so now the caravans started flying across those roads because they had become safe the roads were safe because there was this established han kingdom and they started taking those uh, bales of silk crossing the tian shan mountain and going into those five stands and they were bringing back precious jade from the mountains of tarim basin but slowly the westbound traders realized that there was a huge market for the silk beyond those five stands right up to rome Romans had got a taste of silk they wanted silk china wanted horses the traders realized here was a good deal so they started taking those silk all the way up to rome how did they do that that is where they the whole route the land route that goes all the way from xian or chang an all the way up to constantinople is the overland route and from there they take via the sea to rome that is the beginning of the silk road Rome wanted silk, China wanted horses. China went in search of horses, came back, quelled the Huns, and established their reign. Traders, the whole journey became safe. Traders started trading. They saw that Rome was in need of silk, and they appreciated it more. They started taking it all the way up to Constantinople, and from there they started going by ship to Rome. That is the beginning of the Silk Road. That was 130 BC. so what exactly is the silk road it is not one single road it is a network of roads 
we will see those networks some go a little south some go a little north then they join at kashgar then keep traveling so it goes on it was used by traders for more than 1500 years it was started with the han dynasty of china in 130 bc and ended in 1453 when the ottoman empire closed off the trade with the west we will be seeing this the routes go both over land and sea and they begin in jian and the actually ancient overland route which is anatolia in turkey which is uh, uh, in turkey constantinople is what they were aiming for then the sea route takes over and they take those bales of silk all the way up to rome approximately 6437 kilometers is the distance of the travel which is nothing but 4000 miles and who gave these routes this name it is the german geographer and traveler ferdinand von richthofen who used that word or term sidenstrass or silk road in 1877 ad so th these are some trivia about the silk road or the silk roads so 1500 years 6437 kilometers going from jian on the east of uh, uh, china all the way up to rome to through both land and sea here we go Let's take a look at the legend before I blow up, uh, zoom this out. The Silk Road is part of a vast region comprised of a vast network of both maritime and land routes. They pass through Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. They cross Central Asia, Russian steppes, Iranian and Anatolian plateaus, Arabian Peninsula. They are here in Africa. They are all the way down till here. If you can see Zanzibar, then. and the first thing that strikes you about this particular map is there was no america then this is the ancient silk road there is no america anywhere in sight because the whole story plays out till 1453 so the red color line is the silk road the blue color line it indicates the maritime silk road or also called the spice route yellow color the russian steppe route you have the incense route that is the green color one then you have other trade and connecting routes you can see that this actually some of them refer to this line that goes from takshashila all the way to tamral city in uh, yeah as we north south uh, see uh, silk road but this red line is the silk road actually and the blue line that is going from the east of china across bordia across uh, malacca strait singapore indonesia korea japan coming to anuradhapura across india here is the um, yeah hormuz strait then you have the suez canal you have uh, africa here this is your maritime sea route and you can see that it here gaza alexandra then it joins the land route or rather the red line like i told you they are not uh, it is a collection of routes and not a single road so tracking this red line here you go it starts from changan which is nothing but currently jian later on they actually moved all the way up to loeng so these are some of the subsidiary routes that they had which connects to the maritime silk road so you go to jian now you go up to dunhang here you have already split some go north go through tartan hukaf and then join this is the fergana valley you join it here some go south to khotan kashgar and then join here again they split so this goes on so they join again at mov split join again at nisa again there are multiple routes and if you see the maritime silk route at hormuz again joins and goes to isfahan and joins at tabriz baku this is baghdad all lot of routes depends on the perhaps the goods that they were carrying and the place that they were uh, going to but all of them together is referred to as a silk road so nobody actually calls it the silk road anymore they call it the silk route or routes actually so baghdad you see damascus aleppo here it is constantinople sitting the between asia and A europe the gateway and from here uh, the steppe route also joins over here and from here it goes via sea 
this is where they take the sea go to venice they go to rome finally they even connect barcelona which is spain they go to cordoba they go to portugal porto lisbon and there is one route which actually connects paris so the whole of europe is connected through either the main route the maritime silk route either the overland or sea route all the way the silk has traveled from the east of china all the way to rome which was looking for it so this collection of routes is the ancient silk route and like i told you the first thing that strikes us no america in this map it's because the entire drama plays out within 1453 from 130 bc to 1453 ce when the ottoman empire brings uh, captures constantin constantinople and it's the end of the silk road we'll be touching upon that a little later here it is what were the countries that were involved so it goes from ancient capital of china jian to rome the countries in today's world are azerbaijan china korea egypt indonesia iran iraq italy japan kazakhstan kyrgyzstan malaysia mongolia pakistan russia sri lanka syria the five stars tajikistan turkey turkmenistan ukraine four country which is being attacked right now and uzbekistan these were part of the ancient silk route what was traded or uh, these were the goods that went from east to west obviously silk traveled from china tea traveled yes dyes precious stones china plates bowls cups vases we have heard of all those ming vases and all that stuff it traveled porcelain traveled spices traveled cinnamon and ginger therefore you have the spice route bronze and gold artifacts medicine perfume ivory rice paper and another notable contribution from uh, china gunpowder traveled from east to west what went from the west then what came all the way from uh, the west horses china was started the whole story because of horses so horses came in abundance when horses come their accessories come saddle riding tack grapes came from there dogs and other exotic animals came animal fur obvious skin honey fruits glassware came from there from the west blankets rugs carpets textiles such as curtains it specifically goes on to say that gold and silver came gold artifacts went back camels came yes because there was lot of desert in the west camels came slaves came obviously and weapons and armor came in from the west all the way to china what else was traveled once you have a road it doesn't mean you have to travel a per a particular good only a particular set of items need to travel or to move no way lot many tra uh, items traveled on this route so what else traveled there was exchange of ideas languages culture art religion philosophy scientific discoveries and diseases and i have picked three items for further discussion art religion and diseases when ideas art religion travel they are affected by the uh, destination ideas as well meaning to say when something goes from point a to b it is also influenced by the culture or ideas that already exist in point b so what the original idea could have metamorphosized you will see that and a wide variety of people travel through this merchants obviously migrants yes always refugees will come in missionaries came in we'll see that too artisans yes where artisans all these people come in wherever depends on the work wherever it is like offshore they they will travel diplomats obviously and soldiers yes all of these things traveled along with those goods that we saw in the previous slide let us look at the spread of islam and christianity which came to the asia from west the light lavender is a spread of the christian church by 1000 ce the dark one is major christian missionaries after 1500 and the predominant green color as you can see the dark green portion indicates the spread of islam and you can see the time it is 750 ce islam had already reached afghanistan 
can see over here. And then by 1500, beyond Afghanistan, into China, all the way up to Bengal, and you can see it has gone here to inside China. And then by 1750, it has come all the way down southern India here, and it has gone down Hang to Bangshu in China. These things have got, yeah, this is 1500, Sumatra, Java, and what about the spread of the Christian church? You can see the light lavender shade over here. It starts obviously Jerusalem somewhere there. It goes to, it is heading towards Russia. One big transition going all the way up to Beijing almost. That is how Christianity came into China. And uh, there is another wave coming in in this direction, north of Tibetan Plateau. And uh, how did it come to India? By 1000 AD, it had reached Goa and it had even reached South India somewhere down here. Not exactly Cochin or perhaps Cochin as well. And uh, beyond 1000 to between 1000 and 1500, you will see that Christianity missionaries had started coming in. They had come, I think, to Bombay, Diamond Dew. You will see them here. Then they went all the way to Java. They went from on this maritime route. And the South China Sea, uh, they go through Macau, enter China again. Through the Yellow Sea, they enter China again. They reach Japan. And from Beijing, they have gone to Korea. So this is how the spread of Islam and Christianity graph looks when you look at Islam obviously came in first, 750. Then Christianity came by 1000 AD. And uh, these are the uprisings that were already taking place in the colonial era. And the borders, the blue color border indicates British colonies, obvious. Red color is the Russian colonies. And this yellow color is Dutch colonies. So Islam and Christianity, like I mentioned, the religions which came to the Asia from the West. So what went from the East then? Buddhism traveled from India to China. Very obvious. I think that is why Chinese keep saying India conquered them without even lifting a finger. This is how Buddhism went from India all the way to China. Uh, these dots are the important Buddhist sites. And this is a dark shade is the heartland of the Buddhism, Ganges Valley. 6th to 4th century, this is Buddhist majority region, China, Mongolia. Historical realm is this. You can see we went all the way up to Bactria. Early Buddhist sites, uh, schools are this black, which one started somewhere in Pataliputra, goes to Mathura, to Sanchi, and to Amaravati. We have heard of the Mahayana sect of Buddhism. The red color arrows indicate the uh, spread of Mahayana sect. Uh, it seems to have started with one route goes from Sanchi to Ajanta here. Then from Sanchi it has gone to Mathura, Gandhara. From Gandhara it has gone to Bactria. And Gandhara it takes another diversion, goes to Dong Hong that we saw in China, all the way to Xi'an. The Silk Road, they made good use of it. They actually say it is a merchant who took Buddhism to China. It, it's not the Buddhist monks. And then it went to Chengdu. And uh, here it is. Uh, the, yep. Then there is another line going to Indonesia, going to Java, going to Singapore, going to Malaysia. We went, it went to Philippines. And from Changhan, it has gone to Japan. The Theravada school, the green color arrows, starting from Nalanda, Going to Burma, you will see another line going from Buddha Gaya to Am Amaravati, Anuradhapura, Sri Lanka, went to Xi'an, Cambodia. Theravada seems to have spread a little less. Mahayana seems to be the dominant school over here. And then the Vajrayana Tantric school. Yes, we have heard of these two as well. Uh, it's again Nalanda, Tibet, Chengdu, Changan, and Beijing. It has got another uh, wave, I should say, going to Mongolia. And the Tantric school also went to Sumatra, which has gone to Java. So this is how Buddhism went from India to China with the help of merchants. 
so those were the religious spread of religion and uh, what about diseases yes black death which or uh, the bubonic plague which originated in china spread from 1347 to 51 and uh, killed uh, millions of people so if you can look at the color codes over here 1347 it's actually approaching from the east 1346 here it is again approaching from asia 1346 it is already in constantinople if you look at this black dot it says cities with repeated outbreaks of plague that is uh, between 14th and 18th this is the maritime route that it has taken it has reached constantinople and from there it takes again the sea route and goes all over the place this is the spread of it it goes to naples it goes to rome genoa it goes to marseille barcelona and uh, from there traveling by land it is gone to london 1348 it is there in london and then it goes to greenland over there and if you look at the lavender color by 1350 the northern part of uh, england had bubonic plague 1347 the peach colored part indicates that the spread had reached these portions 1348 green color it is expanding yellow color 1349 again expanding 1350 reaching the remote part northern uh, england 1351 kiev moscow and this is uh, for some reason this small portion seems to be relatively unaffected so this is how this is also traveled on that great silk road that uh, china invested it so architecture is one item i thought we should look at uh, and i picked the uh, masjid registan masjid from samarkand basically this cause uh, the mogul kings babur came from samarkand samarkand is in the fargana valley in uzbekistan this is the tamerlane's uh, registan masjid and on the right you will see the lahori gate of uh, red fort delhi what you see on the left is completely islamic architecture and what you see on the right is indo islamic architecture so that is why i mentioned when an idea travels or traveled it comes in contact with the established culture and metamorphosis metamorphosis happens so what do we see here i want you to look at the uh, arch of the doorway if you can see that the arch here and the arch in the lahori gate are similar they look the same but if you look at the ramparts if you look at all other parts you can see that they don't look like the architecture on the left so obviously what you see on the right hand side is indo islamic what you see on the left is islamic so islamic ideas came in but then they had to negotiate with the established ideas here and this is what gave birth to the indo islamic style this again the golden ceiling of silia kori madrasa again samarkand i i've, i've been given to understand that even now you can see gold it seems on the ceilings of these um, mosques and madrasas in uh, samarkand i was looking at it uh, i just saw a travel log and it looks uh, those places look very beautiful on the right you are slowly captured a picture of the ceiling of uh, bibi ka makbara in aurangabad you can see the similarities not just with respect to the center portion the concentric part you can even see these portions the arches they are similar to what you see over here so i just picked these two items for discussion for the uh, travel of architecture and basically travel of islamic architecture coming and meeting the ideas existing in hindustan india whatever and becoming indo islamic architecture so these were the three items i picked for what else the traveled on the silk road now going on to famous travelers again like i told you there were many famous travelers who have traveled but i picked uh, these three we have heard of his name marco polo he traveled between venice and pagan in china between 1271 to 1295 on the right hand side is a picture of uh, his travel and on the left hand side you can see that he started here venice he comes to akre akar i don't know how he pronounces then he goes to trebizond then he comes to baghdad cherbil hormuz i think this is balkh kashgar lanzo beijing 
Chengdu and Pagan. This is his journey. And uh, he goes back. Uh, his journey back is again from here. And this time he takes a sea route actually. Pagan, Chengdu, Hangzhou, South Chinese Sea, crosses or over from India, Sri Lanka both. He enters the Arabian Sea. He goes through the Hormuz Strait, Terbil, Trebizond, Constantinople and back. This is his travel. Why I picked up Marco Polo is because of all the famous writers, he goes back and he writes a book um, on the uh, splendors of what he has seen. And uh, it is here that uh, this book, this is the first book that is written on this great journey. And uh, yeah, that is why Marco Polo becomes a very important person because many of the people who followed him actually refer this book. For example, I was uh, reading Will Darlampel's uh, uh, Zanadu. He actually talks about his mentor. He mimics his hero, Robert Byron, who travels to Afghanistan, Persia in 1800s. It is called The Road to Oxiana. And he in turn refers to the book by Marco Polo's journey. So Marco Polo becomes the most important person in among the famous travelers just because he went ahead and wrote a book. It is called The Travels of Marco Polo. It opened Western eyes to some of the customs of the Far East, but he is the one who is most widely read. He becomes famous because of that. And here is the famous Ibn Battuta. Nobody, I, I don't think there is any traveler who can beat the kind of traveling that he has done. He has traveled 11,7,000 kilometers over 30 years from 1325 to 1354. This is, this is, this is his travel, actually. Uh, he set out from his native Tangier in 1325 when he was just 21. He says goodbye and he starts traveling and then keeps traveling for 30 years. He has covered almost 12,000 kilometers and nearly every part of the Islamic world. So let's go on a journey with uh, Ibn Battuta. This is Tangier. He was born in 1304 and uh, he became a student of Sunni Islamic law. And on June 14th, exactly 1325, he left town and headed east on his first journey. Here it is, Tangier. So where does he go? He is looking, I think first all his travels were concentrated on Islamic centers. So he travels to here, Mediterranean Sea. He goes to Cairo, Luxor, and Jeddah and reaches Mecca. So made his first pilgrimage or actually Hajj to Mecca in 1326. He reaches the place in 1326, October, and he gives himself up to circuits, pious exercises, and frequent performance of the lesser pilgrimage. So he would go back twice more, making his final Hajj in 1348 on his way back from Morocco. Next, from Mecca, he travels. Look at his travel. He goes all the way up like this to Constantinople. He arrived in the Byzantine capital in 1330 and stayed for more than a month. He is amazed by what he has seen. Churches, monasteries, places of worship, which he says are innumerable. And from Constantinople, I picked Ivan Batota not just because of his travels, because all of him have all of us have heard that he reached India. And there he is, traveling from Constantinople, New Sarai, Bukharo, Samarkand, Kabul, Multan, Delhi. He is in Delhi. 1334 and he spent eight years here as a judge in the court of the Sultan of Delhi, the greatest city of Hindustan and indeed of all Islamism in East is what he writes. That is 1334. From Delhi, he goes to Maldives. This is the route that he has taken to Maldives. Spent nine months over road here and he wrote, he gave that he looks like he found uh, that those people were, uh, I shouldn't be using that word, he had a lot of slave girls and four wives during his stay in Maldives. So, 13, that is, yeah, the Maldives, from Maldives, he goes to Adam Speak, Ceylon. Here, uh, Muslims believe there is a footprint shaped depression at the top of a mountain. That is where Adam landed after being expelled from aid. So that is what you'll find in Ada, Adam Speak. He comes here in, uh, yeah, he comes here. From here, goes to China. Ibn Batuta is in China. Yep. 
he says uh, his notes that he writes actually after going back so mr ibn batuta sits down and uh, chronicles his journeys they say the itinerary here is sketchy and he says they are all infidels but he marveled at the abundance of fruits agriculture gold and silver that was without a parallel in china and uh, from china he goes to aleppo yeah here Th this is his travel coming back i think yeah from here he's gone all the way till here so here he is almost straight all the way to aleppo 1348 June 1348, Mr. Ibn Battuta is in Aleppo, and this is on his way back from Mecca again. He learned of the devastating uh, uh, bubonic plague, and he avoided it becoming ill. But the time uh, he came here, it had subsided. Okay, from Aleppo he goes to Fez, closer to Tangier, 1354. settled down to dictate his memoir a gift to the observers concerning the curiosities of the cities and marvels encountered in travels 54 to 68 he chronicles his 30 year journey and uh, i picked him like i said not because of the innumerable years of travel that he did though that is a that is something that i would love it is because he had come to india that is why i picked uh, ibn batuta this great person jang he he is another uh, but this is something that is sponsored by the emperors of uh, china he journeys between 14 not high and 1433 and why it becomes important his journey is because this travel that he has done is the precursor to the maritime silk route this is, he makes seven journeys from china and th this what you are saying the red color is the route that he has covered in totality so this is what he has traveled in totality we can see he has taken the sea route he was in cochin he was in sri lanka he was here in java he was here in aden he was in mogadishu he was in mombasa he was in mecca hormuz yes chitagong yes so this is his travel and what exactly happened during the seven uh, voyages of his um he took a, it is called actually the treasure journeys of uh, china voyages and he took a lot of treasures wealth rather from china they were trying to project their uh, um i should say power in terms of uh, what they had and they would go knocking it is more like a ashwamedha yaga they go knocking at these kingdoms they show off they give them the gold and the silver artifacts and then uh, brow beat them into accepting the suzerainty of china so he did seven such treasure voyages and uh, he brought back a lot of diplomats from the um, countries which accepted uh, chinese suzerainty so this is the but it, because he took the sea route this route is the precursor to the maritime sea route and then he comes back and he wrote a book again it is a gift to those who contemplate the wonders of cities and marvels of traveling he says it is called oh sorry that is ibn batuta uh this uh, yeah seven ming treasure voyages they were referred to and uh, this is the route that he has taken they projected their wealth and they expanded their kingdom this is what he did yes so we have got 6437 kilometers to travel obviously one person doesn't travel along the entire length there are a lot of car um, caravans right which host them and there are a lot of bazaars so there are small traders big traders trading happens all the way so let us look at what what are the features of a caravan sarai because it is the basic unit of uh, infrastructure that is available at a day's distance from each other across the entire silk road so the i, I like this where worlds and ideas connect uh, they had a lot of uh, um, features available for example you have the courtyard uh, the courtyard was a hub of activity people met animals found space to rest there were small bazaars set up here there was water available here and uh, it often housed a fountain or a large well for water both for animals for human beings 
there was providing for animals so uh, they had the first floor for stables obviously to house the livestock large open spaces were also available there were also store rooms where hay and feed were available good you come there is water there is uh, for your livestock there is food there is space to tie them up and uh, there were rooms on the first second level a small room uh, you could spend the night there uh, there would be a window if you were lucky and there might be a small place to heat it up and uh, what about security here you go fortified entrances single entrance fortified walls there were outposts where soldiers sat up looking out and uh, taking care of you as you slept the night through and uh, caravans arrived in northern india supplied a messenger horses that traveled to larger cities with important news so you can see here this is how from shian as you travel on the silk road caravan sarais were available at a day's distance so all you had to do was travel a day and you would come to the next caravan sarai so the travelers so obviously like i told none of them would travel the entire length they would travel part of the portion they would sell up with local traders retailing would happen wholesaling would happen they would stop rest to either trade or to replenish their stores and the caravan sarai also provided a marketplace where you could actually trade with other uh, uh, traders so you could set up your wares on tables or on the ground and there was a separate area attached with stalls or tables in this case they are showing a separate area look at the entrance a small limited entrance because it is a fortified area large wooden gate marks the entrance needed to be wide and tall because it had to let in animals mostly um, camels i'm assuming heavily laden horses and camels to get through and storage space was available number of storage spaces for grain hay food stuff and even merchandise could be stored here so this is uh, uh, an ideal uh, uh, picture of an ideal caravan sarai that was available all across the silk road here you see a very well kept uh, caravan sarai even now you can see it it is in cairo the kala of sultan alguri 1504 to 1505 best preserved examples is what i get to see on the internet you can see the fountain this is the first level the second level you could have rooms up above a very impressive uh, example but then apart from trading in the caravan sarai there were bazaars all along the route and here is one bazaar again a very well preserved bazaar tabriz grand bazaar in iran which is used even now you can see that there are shops even now and uh, look at the filigree like architecture i hear that this is one of the most uh, beautiful and well kept uh bazaar on the ancient route and used even now it is a part of a unesco world heritage site this is reminding me almost like lace like work the arches the top of the arches it is in the center of tabriz grand it's called the tabriz grand bazaar in iraq all good things come to an end so the ancient silk road ended how did it end the mongols have been expelled but their uh, chinese emperor began uh, kingdom began to decline then mongols their kingdom began to decline timur the lame that is where fergana valley samarkand come into the picture and it ended almost by 1404 so again that route becomes insecure if somebody is not taking care of them or if it is not part of a kingdom that was one reason but the most important reason was the crusades the christians were taking back the kingdoms on the eastern side of the mediterranean one at a time that was already islamic kingdom and they um, obviously the muslims were fighting back and they were driving them back so what happens is in 1453 turkish muslim uh, army finally captured the christian stronghold of constantinople constantinople as we saw sits in the center of it connects asia and europe that was a transit point Constantinople, Constantinople fell to the or the Byzantine Empire came to an end 1453 and Muslims took control so now people from the other side of Constantinople so the westerners could not travel securely on the silk road that's it so the two portions were cut off the sea route and the land route were cut off by this capture the europeans were no longer able to travel freely on the western part the silk route had ended 
but one door closes another one opens up what do we see after the after the end of the silk uh, ancient silk road by 15th century there was lot of uh, knowledge that was available with the byzantine the sasanian and the arab libraries and that was being read the reread and digested by the europeans and at this point the turning that happened is nothing but the renaissance which means rebirth just a digression over here uh will darlampel is writing a book called the golden road which goes all the way from india all the way up i think to europe and he says most of the information that was available with the arabs was something that was gleaned from india it should be that book should be out in uh, 23 24 and what i like about will darlampel is he quotes a lot of books reference books so i i would like to think what he writes is authentic i'm waiting for that book and uh, coming back so new dis- so all those ideas the churning that was happening discoveries were being made in science and finally the europeans realized the earth was round and you could go to the east by traveling west around the globe see they couldn't come east because constantinople was taken and they were asunder i can say they cannot cross that and come towards the uh, land so they cannot travel east on the land but what do they discover because of all this turning they discover that since the earth is round i can go west as well and keep traveling and keep traveling until i reach china by the sea so what had begun the age of discovery or the age of exploration had begun 1453 marks the end of the silk road with the capture of constantinople by the muslims byzantine empire came to an end and silk road ended but another dawn age of discovery age of exploration began